Good evening and welcome to BHA Live. I am Trevor Brugger and I will be your host of tonight's installation of our ongoing series of Friday Night Educational Experiences. We're thrilled that you all decided to come back after last week's session. <laughs> we are very excited to see so many of you joining us tonight for what I'm sure will be a great presentation on vocal health with our very special guest, Beck Hewitt. During this session, you'll be able to interact with each other using the chat function on the side of your screen. You'll also be able to ask the presenters questions by using the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. Now, it is really important that you use the Q&A function because we will not be monitoring the chat throughout the session, only the Q&A. Now, with that general housekeeping done, on with the show. Beck Hewitt has been actively involved in music and performance for over 25 years as a soloist, band vocalist, and a choral singer. In the 16 years since her introduction to Barbershop, Beck has participated as a chorus member, a vocal teacher, a coach to soloists, quartets, and choruses, a quartet singer, and a director. But most recently, also as a singing judge in the Australasian Guild of Barbershop Judges. Beck has performed in both small and large choruses, with both choruses winning regional, Australian, gold medals with SAI. And in 2018, directed a national silver medal winning medium-sized chorus, Vocal Evolution. She also competed both regionally and internationally with Australia's seven-time champion quartet, Hijinx. As a sought-after coach and teacher, she frequently travels around Australia and New Zealand, providing voice coaching and teaching aspects of vocal production, music vocal interpretation, balance blend, and practice techniques. In her life outside of Barbershop, Beck operates her own music business called Just Sing, where she teaches voice and performance to singers of all ages and all styles. With her husband, Aaron, she lives in Perth, Western Australia, with her two ginger cats and a puppy. And of course, they love to travel, but it's usually for barbershop. Beck's musical passion is working with singers and groups and helping them to find their inner voice and realise their potential. Please give a warm welcome to Beck Hewitt. Hi, everyone. So it's really great to be here tonight. I'm looking forward to talking with everybody and... Please, as uh, Trev's just said, if you do have any questions through the night, feel free to pop them in the chat function and ask them away while I answer whatever I can. So tonight we're going to be looking at vocal health for singers. And first and foremost, before we even get started on that, I do need to say, I'm not a doctor. So if you do feel like there's something not quite right with your voice, please make sure you go and talk to your doctor and get a referral through to an ENT. But the reason why we're talking about this today is that over my years of teaching and performing, it has become apparent that we all, and myself included, sing and our, use our voices even when we probably shouldn't be. Now, I've learnt this the hard way a couple of times. Tired, sick, vocally compromised. Sometimes we need to really understand more how our voice is working efficiently and when we really should be, use, should be resting our voice. So as a result, I've become very passionate about helping singers to understand vocal health, and in particular, what is efficient vocal health for them. So the purpose of today is first and foremost to raise awareness of vocal health. What do we do with our voices in our day-to-day -day life, and how can we protect and use it more efficiently so that we can maintain it long-term? Uh, some of the early warning signs for vocal concerns and vocal fatigue, how we can avoid that harm in the first place with preemptive measures and how we can maintain our voice while we are in isolation and in our general life as um, in our general life with work and singing before we talk about vocal health though i thought we should take the time to understand the vocal mechanism a little bit more so what we have here in front of us is a cross-section view of a head so we can see uh, the tongue, we can see the larynx, we can see the oral and uh, nasal spaces. So let's talk about this and understand this a little bit more. So firstly, the larynx actually sits at the top of the trachea, the trachea here, the windpipe, 
and behind that we can see, and I, I hope you can all see the cursor that I'm using to indicate these things. We can see the, as I said, the trachea, and we can see the esophagus where for the food. The larynx actually sits here just above, or just at the very top of the trachea, um, kind of like a hose fitting really. And the vocal folds, the vocal cords, the vocal folds actually sit across the, 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 pipe, the trachea, across the windpipe. Sound is created by air passing through the vocal folds, causing them to uh, come together and vibrate, and travels up through the oral space, through the mouth, and out. This, um, we can see here the epiglot, uh, not the epiglot, sorry, we can see here the soft palate. The soft palate is what we, uh, we talk about lifting the soft palate so that we can close off sound into the nasal passage. So we, when we're singing, we want to make sure that that soft palate is lifted and closed, so that no uh, sound air is so that no air is passing through our nose. When air passes through our nose, we get a bit of a nasal quality when we speak and sing. So we really want to make sure that that soft palate is always closed when we sing, unless we're specifically trying to make a point. Moving on, if we take that same uh, diagram um, and we look at it from above using what uh, this this image here is going to be a from one of the uh, cameras that are used for looking at our vocal folds it comes up through the nose and looks at the vocal folds through here so we can see looking down on the vocal folds we can see this V at the front here that's actually the front of the vocal folds so that's here at the larynx level and we can see the vocal folds um, ac the, forming across the, the trachea. The folds consist of muscle, ligament, and mucosa, and the cartilage, muscle, and membrane are around are, are the parts that are around. And the vocal mechanism is a component of sound production, cough reflex, and protects the lower respiratory tract. So before we continue on, now is a really great time to ask your anatomy questions. So if you have any, please fire away. Beck, I think you're doing a great job. Um, we have no questions <laughs> at the moment. Oh, that's great. Excellent. So as we move on then, let's talk about things that can influence our voice. So remembering that the, vo that the voice is those two vocal folds coming together, that vibrating together to create sound as air passes through. Things that we do in our day-to-day -day life though can influence how those vocal folds, how efficiently those vocal folds work. So our voice, like our body, is robust and very resilient to our daily wear and tear, particularly when we use good recovery techniques such as rest, hydration, and good vocal habits. That being said, sometimes our voice can feel the strain. And so some of these things that can cause vocal concerns include shouting. So even talking above noise in a loud room for a long period of times. Now, seriously, how many times have we been at a, an afterglow? I love afterglows, but they're very loud, aren't they? And so how many times have we come away from the end of one of those nights thinking, gee, a little sore, a little tired, even maybe a little croaky, so that, that impact of just continuous um, effort has implications. Not in effective production techniques. There's a reason why we constantly are working to improve our vocal technique. We want to make sure that our voice is being used in its most efficient manner to avoid any uh, vocal concerns or any um, impact on our voice. But when we aren't using our voice well, that can have an impact. Uh, so ineffective production techniques, including alignment and breath in particular. The lowering of vocal pitch for authority. Now, this one's particularly more for our ladies, but nonetheless, it can affect anybody who does this. So for, for women in positions of um, authority, uh, wanting to lower their voice in the effort to sound more authoritative, when done for long periods of time, can have an influence on their voice. And again, a number of these factors tonight that we're talking about are actually more about the longer that they're done, the more impact that they have. Independently, they may not, so much, they may not have as large an impact. 
not using vocal rest when needed. So, you know, how many times have we all had a sore throat or we've had a little bit of fatigue, you know, that Sunday morning after convention or Sunday morning after retreat when we're vocally tired and yet we're still pushing through when we probably should be resting, <laughs> you know, with just something we need to keep in the back of our mind. Illness, health concerns such as reflux, allergy, poor general health, these can all have an impact on what's happening with our voice. Some medicines and some cough lozenges are quite drying, as is some mouthwashes. Stress, it affects the rest of the body, so it will affect the voice as well. Using voice in environments when we should be amplified, so uh, again, for those who present for a living, if you are presenting in a room that is where you're really having to raise your voice all the time, then we have a, it has an impact on the voice when we should be using amplification instead. There's only so long that our voice will happily be used in that manner before it starts to feel compromised. Coughing, clearing throat excessively. Whispering or speaking in excessively breathy tones. So I've got a sore throat today, so I'm going to whisper instead. But that still has an impact on our voice. And in fact, whispering um, on uh, whispering, the vocal folds come together when we make sound in a, in a manner that has good adduction. However, if we whisper, they come together in a, a less full manner, and that manner creates more irritation. So whispering is not necessarily the answer when we have a sore throat. And excessive use of vocal fry in speech, something a little more common with our younger singers because they, uh, there's a lot, actually quite a deal of research out there in the vocal community about the use of vocal fry in teenagers' voices and the, the concerns that they're get, um, damaging their voices with. So they're dropping their voices down here at the ends of all of their phrases. And so it's, you know, again, part of that long-term use. So when we think about these contributing factors, the thing we want to keep in mind is this, well, we, we, an analogy for the contributing factors. Think of vocal folds like as if our hands were clapping. So if we all do this together now, and I'm going to put my hands over here so it's not so loud on the mic. If we clap our hands, how long do you have to keep clapping your hands before they start to feel some irritation, before they start to get tired? If we think about the vocal folds in the same manner, that motion of movement together, the impact on their own, maybe not, but when it's done over a period of time, then we start to see some concerns with our voice. So we really need to be looking for rest at this point. The voice, like any other part of our body, is a tissue that needs to heal. The performance itself may not cause any concern. But talking above the noise at the afterglow, after the big performance, that may influence the vocal recovery. Rest is really important part of recovery. So, we've been working with our voice and now we're starting to notice that something doesn't feel quite right. So how do we know something isn't quite right? Firstly, Understanding what our voice is like when it's its most efficient is part of this process. Knowing how our voice works the best helps us to identify when something isn't quite right. And also, again, as per the beginning of my uh, uh, presentation here, if you have any concerns about your voice, please go and talk to a doctor. Please go and get a referral to an ENT. So, common symptoms. Discomfort in the throat. Now, discomfort in the throat can take many forms. Fatigue, dryness, ache, scratchy, tiredness or effort. Needing to clear the throat frequently. Let's say that really fast. <laughs> Needing to clear the throat frequently. <laughs> Again, these are symptoms of vocal fatigue. So that tiredness that we get after use. Uh, think of it in the same way as if you were playing sport and you know you played at the end of the day and you're feeling a little bit tired. Would you keep going or would you rest? That's that sort of fatigue we're talking about. These, sim these symptoms are also symptoms of vocal concerns though. So it becomes a question of how long is it between um, fatigue and vocal concern? Well, 
any length of time is the difference really. Some other symptoms of vocal fatigue, vocal concerns include huskiness or hoarseness, voice breaks, cracks, and vocal loss. And at some point, I'm, I'm sure that many of us have experienced various forms of these symptoms. So before we continue, are there any questions? Oh, that absolutely is, Beck. They've come out of the woodwork now. I'm uh, not sure where they were earlier, but we've got them now. Um, no worries. The question is, we're going to back it up a little bit. The second image that you were talking us through, I think it was the one where you were describing the camera. That's yes, yes. right there. Yeah. Um, the question is, well, it's more of a statement, I guess. Is the trachea's face is, or is uh, mostly covered by the muscle tissue, it appears. Um, mm -hmm. Is that, it, it doesn't seem to be open that much. Uh, that's currently open for breath only. So that the, the image that we can see here is somebody breathing in and out. Uh, okay, well, I'm sure that answers the statement, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our second question is, is the oral cavity the main resonating chamber? Going back to that image, the oral, as we can see, there is the tongue in this particular image. I really do need to find a better image. The tongue in this particular image is actually sitting really high. It doesn't actually sit that high all the time when we're singing and speaking. So we would actually see more space in here. So, but generally, yes, the, the resonance space is the vocal tract, which is from the larynx all the way up through the back of the throat and through the mouth. We use the nasal space for resonation only when we're singing M's, N's and NG's because the sound is coming through the nose, not through the mouth. Otherwise, it's, it's all of that, you know, oral, oral and uh, laryngeal pharynx space. Excellent. Thank you. And there's, a, there's a couple of questions around vocal fry, so I'll, I'll combine them into one. Can, sure. you, um, can you give us, a, a bit, I guess, a bit of a description of, of vocal fry? And, and you, you kind of touched on this before, but I think as singers, a few of us have, have heard that vocal fry is a, is a really good way to relax. Is it um, damaging to the vocal mechanism, which I think you kind of hinted at before? So vocal fry in itself is not, an in, it, like, like many things, isn't something that is an impact on the voice on its own. In fact, yes, vocal fry is a fabulous way of relaxing the voice. The issue for vocal fry uh, from a vocal uh, pedagogy perspective is the length of time that it's used. So uh, for many young singers, that because they spend so much of their time speaking in their vocal fry, they're no longer using their voice efficiently all the time, they're putting it into a state of relaxation all the time in a way that's not um, effectively supporting the voice for more consistent use. Awesome, thank you. Uh, just a couple of more. So sure. I'm gonna try and ask some ones that are specific to what we're, we're talking about and I'll leave mm -hmm. the more generic inquiry-based ones towards the end. Um, this is a great one, it's something that I've, I've often wondered myself. Um, if the vocal folds are a muscle, should we train them for endurance, kind of like an athlete would? So the vocal folds actually consist of part, um, the folds themselves, by the way, uh, consist of part muscle and part mucosa and part ligament. So the, the white, so in this diagram here, back on that vocal mechanism, we can see the white part in this diagram, that is the vocal folds themselves and the round is the vocal mechanism. So in terms of training that muscle, look, I read a, I'm trying to remember the quote I read today, actually. It was, uh, it said it really well that, that there's basically a fine line in how much we can train that, that muscle per se. It's, it's actually more about the coordinate, it's training the coordination rather than training it to build up capacity. Excellent. Well, that, um, that, that, that probably all the questions for now, Vic. No worries. So we're up to, so we've talked about the things that influence the voice and we've talked about the, the things that can, um, symptoms that we can see when we have perhaps used our voice further than we probably should have at the time. So how can we avoid it in the first place? Because let's be honest, that's the best option really, isn't it? Let's, let's avoid the misuse in the first place. So here's a few things that we can consider. So reducing vocal misuse, avoid clearing throat. So for many of us, myself included, with hay fever and sinuses and things like that, 
uh, we, we get quite a bit of post-nasal drip uh, and whatnot. So we need to try and avoid clearing our throat. Or if we have medications that are causing that excessive buildup there, you know, talk to our doctor to perhaps change those meds so that we can avoid needing to clear our throat. You know, that doesn't mean that we're going to stop doing it completely. That doesn't mean we're going to avoid coughing and things like that completely. But we do want to try and minimize these things as we can. Never sing and avoid talking with a sore throat. Now, this is tough because, you know, the, as I said uh, at the beginning, the, I've learned the lesson the hard way about not singing when sick. And sore throat's that one where we, we've got a performance coming up, we've got a gig coming up, and we think, I've got to do it, I've got to sing through it. And when we sing with a sore throat, the problem is, is that that's already irritated. And so we're, we're adding more irritation, and that's when things start to get a little bit, you know, things can get hurt. So in the same way that we would consider the rest of our body, and so we wouldn't walk if we'd sprained our ankle or we'd try and avoid walking when we sprained our ankle or twisted our ankle or strained a muscle, another muscle in our body, why don't we consider our voice in the same manner? Warming up our voices in the morning if we know we're going to have a vocally heavy day. So for those of us, again, who are in presentations, um, jobs, teaching, uh, any of those jobs where we have to be talking a lot, we really want to make sure that we're warming up our body, uh, warming up our voice in the same way, again, back to those sports analogies, that we warm up our body before we put it under intense work. We should be warming up our voice as well and cooling down again at the end of the day. And it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be a, a huge amount of time. Some humming, some gentle sirens, some SOVT exercises. That's the semi-cold vocal tract exercises like the straw and bubbling and trilling and things like that. Anything that we can just gent get the voice in use before we start using and abusing sort of thing. Stay hydrated. Now, we, again, back to the whole body. The whole body has to be hydrated. So, of course, the voice needs to be hydrated. And if we wait until the hour before the presentation or the hour before the performance to start drinking a huge amount of water, I'm sorry to say, it's just a little too late. We actually have to be drinking in the 24 hours leading up to it to be hydrated. Take care of loud spaces. Again, back to those restaurants, afterglows. I know afterglows are so much fun. See if you can find a quieter place at the afterglow. Take care of those loud spaces for having to raise your voice. Avoid smoky spaces. We know how much smoke, smoking can irritate, so we need to avoid that as well. Use amplification if talking in an environment that requires projection. You know, don't be, don't be afraid to use that. You know, it, it, we can all take one for the team and, and just project out into a room, but is that our best vocal choice? And the number one thing that we can do to avoid vocal misuse is vocal rest. So if we've used our voice, if we're tired, if we're sick, if we're sore, rest. That means stop speaking as well as stop speaking. Uh, stop speaking as well as stop speaking. <laughs> stop speaking as well as stop singing. And before we go, uh, no, I'll keep going. I will save the questions for the end now. Vocal maintenance. So as we continue through this COVID life, uh, for the foreseeable anyhow, whereas we're going to be continuing to work in our own spaces on our own, how can we look after our voice? And how can we look after our voice in the long-term future after COVID? Well, beyond the things that we've just talked about in terms of avoiding things that can hurt our voice, there are things we can do in our day-to-day -day life to help with our vocal maintenance. The big one, make a point of using your voice every day. Talk with your uh, pets, talk with your family, sing along with the radio, call a friend, um, sing your chorus songs, and that comes nicely into our next one, perform your chorus songs or your quartet songs regularly. And note that I say perform, not sing. We all know that there's a difference between singing along with the radio and that full on karaoke feeling we have when we're performing, performing. We know that there's a different physical engagement in our body as well as in our voice. So we do need to make sure that we perform our songs regularly. Now I'm sure you, our, all of our directors out there would love, I love it if we could do this every single day. 
And ideally that's what we want. But of course, if we can just get, you know, a couple of times a week where we're performing in full performance mode, why not in front of a mirror so we can see what we're doing, performing our songs regularly just to keep our voice in use. Vocal exercises. If at the bare minimum, your vocal work each day is some vocal exercises, your director will still thank you because you are keeping your voice in use and you're working to try and improve it, particularly if you're doing these exercises with a point in mind, whatever your particular thing is, is that you're trying to work on with your voice is. So these exercises don't need, again, don't need to be hours and hours of time, you know, 10, 10, 15 minutes scattered across the day a few different times. SVO, um, SOVT exercises again, humming, sirens, scales, bubbling, trilling, trilling your songs, bubbling your songs, just anything that's going to keep that voice in use. Because you know what? At the end of the day, singing releases endorphins. And in the world that we live with now and in the world in general, why not do something that's going to release, release endorphins and bring us joy every single day? And at that point, I open the floor to questions. <laughs> So we've, we're going to go back a little bit further again. Is the the question is around is, is around vocal fry, which we've already spoken about. But just mm -hmm. a little bit more clarification about you know what's actually happening to the mechanism during vocal fry, and can we have an example? Vocal fry. So vo vocal fry is um, the vocal folds we have, as we've said before they come together. Um, uh, when we create sound by air passing through, causes them to rub together. As they rub together, they create sound in various forms, depending on how long or short the folds themselves are. Vocal fry is when the folds are still moving together, but they're in a much more slack state. So we get a sound that's more of a... Uh, and though we can move that up and down through our range a little bit, it's still about them being in that more slack, relaxed state. On its own, vocal fry isn't a problem. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that I can understand the concern that's associated with it, though, because what is the difference between good vocal fry and, and concerning vocal fry? And it really does boil down to, like so many things, it's the length of time that it's done. For us, yeah. using it as a singing technique, it's not, that's not the problem. Yeah, excellent. Um, well, we've got a lot to get through as far as question goes, but you know we've got time, so keep keep them firing in. Absolutely, um, a nice easy one for you. Can you please repeat what SOTV means? S O V T, semi occult vocal tract. <clears throat> excellent. So Thank you. it's like bubbling and trilling and straw exercise and all that sort of thing. Uh, perfect. Um, all right, another question. Um, I'd be interested in your view on the usefulness of stemple exercises. Uh, I would have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> Excellent answer. <clears throat> um, oh, here's, here's a good one, actually. Do you cool down the voice similar to the way you warm up in the morning? Yeah, sirens, humming, um, SOVT exercises again. Yeah. Cool. And what harm does um, clearing the throat actually do? So clearing the throat and coughing have a similar impact on the voice in that, so book folds rub together. Uh, when we make, uh, when we breathe in and out, they're open. When we cough, the best analogy we can think of for coughing, or the best analogy I can give, sorry, for coughing and clearing throat is that imagine the vocal folds go out and then constantly in the same way that clapping irritates the hands after a period of time. So does this motion on the folds over a period of time. Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a really good explanation and, and probably a message. A lot of us, uh, especially for us who aren't, aren't musically trained or vo certainly voice trained can take back to our choruses because uh, you see people coughing all the time. Yeah. Well, and the reality is we can't stop the cough when it happens, you know, it, it's there and, you know, we just have to handle what's going on at the time, but we can try and minimize it. You know, we can, you know, drink, drink some water to try and minimize it. We can um, swallow. Uh, we can, you know, just even just a, a very 
well, yeah, just drink some water, swallow. Go with those ones for the moment, yeah. And while we're on it, I'll put my own sneaky question in since I can't fill in the Q&A myself. <laughs> you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of the time people will cough because, you know, they've, um, they've been bothered by something that feels like there's on their throat, whether it's uh, mucus or phlegm, you know, whatever it might be. If coughing is, is not, you know, a good way to get rid of that because you don't want to slap our vocal folds, what would you recommend to, to make that feel more comfortable before going on stage? Uh, so, well, there's a couple of parts to that question. So firstly, if we just go back, I'm just going to go back and share that PowerPoint again. Because I need to show something in particular that answers part of that question. So, there we go. Can we, we can all see that again? Yep, it's all good from here. So, the larynx and the vocal folds is right here. This little uh, white horn looking shape, I guess, is the epiglottis. When we swallow, that closes down across the top of the space here so that, it will so that whatever we're swallowing will pass down through the esophagus and into the stomach. So when we are s swallowing anything to remove it from the throat, we're actually removing it from this upper space here rather than the larynx itself. So that's, the, so that's something we just need to keep in mind is that anything that feels like it's here is actually more likely to be up here. If it's sitting on here, then you're going to start coughing. Yes, because it's trying to get into the, I guess it's, it's a bit like when we swallow something the wrong way and we end up coughing. It's that, that's when it lands there. So, can, uh, so just that point. Do you mind just repeating the other part to your question so that I can then continue that? So if we feel like there's there's phlegm or mucus or something that is affecting our, our singing, yes. how can we help make that feel more comfortable? So uh, I attended a Steve Scott workshop uh, last year, which is a fantastic workshop in Canberra. Thank you to Brenda Bella Harmony for uh, Harmony Chorus for running that. And he was talking about there's a couple of different ways of clearing the throat. So one of them is... Uh, quite a good one that I thought I can, I can share today. So the idea is, is that we're trying to pass air through with uh, pass through air past the folds with as minimal amount of sound as possible. Or yes, with, with a minimal amount of sound um, that is pitched. So we get more, uh, so we're just trying to force air through. So we get a <gasps> sort of effect. And the reality is, is that as that air passes through, it's, it's causing things to vibrate through there so that it shifts and then you can swallow it. Excellent. Well, actually, now, now you mention that, I do remember him covering that at Harmony Academy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. The other but... one that's not a bad one is to just do a really low trill as well, which will do the same yeah. thing. So the trill, the tongue trill, the... And a very, very low pitched one, so it'll have the same effect. It'll just cause things to shake around and then you can spit it up or swallow. <laughs> Guess? How <laughs> lovely is that? <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> I guess the next one's more of a comment um, from, from Helen. Thank you, Helen. Uh, the staple exercises are a, a very appropriate, a very appropriate for the use as a way to maintain a healthy voice and as a rehabilitation technique. And uh, Helen's a speech pathologist that actually specializes in the voice. So that's a fantastic contribution. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, what foods and drinks should be avoided before singing? <laughs> well, I guess... Look, my answer to that one's always about it's very individual. You know, there's there's a lot of talk out there about, you know, you hear don't have dairy and don't have this and don't have that. But in the end, it becomes very personal. We we just, it, it's about, again, understanding how our voice works its most efficiently and avoiding things that hinder that. Yeah, perfect. <clears throat> All right. Um, why do we generally lose the top and the bottom of our vocal range when we become vocally fatigued? Well, let's bring it back to, I'm trying to think of a really great way to describe this. Let's again, bring it back to sports, you know, because we're Australian. So we use lots of sports analogies. So in the same way that our, vo our body gets used uh, in our day-to-day -day life and we might, you know, we're, we're playing a sport and it, it, we get towards the end of the day and we start to lose the full stretch of motion that we are able to do because the muscles start to get tired and uh, lose some of their flexibility as we use them. The voice has that same effect. So it's just, 
it's getting it's getting tired and so it's not using it's not being used to its best efficiency anymore yep and if, if that starts happening you know towards the end of a matinee and we know that we've got a, a night show to go what can we do during that two three hour window to help um, rest rest <laughs> <laughs> rest Never. water uh some very gentle sovt uh some steaming you know but basically just give your voice a chance to just have some downtime and some recovery yeah perfect <clears throat> right we've got a question from our victorian uh regional chairman mr rob lee uh he's Hi, a bass <laughs> <laughs> how can rob produce the vocal purring that seems to separate the elite guys from the rest of us mere mortals Practice. Practice. <laughs> <laughs> and, but more than that, let, let me go just a smidge more than that. So it, it's, yes, it's about practice, but it's also about efficient practice. So knowing exactly what it is about our voice that we're needing to improve on and working on improving that specifically in a daily stepwise fashion. You know, it's, it's, it's all well and good for us to know that we've got to work on something and improve something. But if the only time we work on it and improve that is the hour before a chorus rehearsal or quartet rehearsal, then that's probably not going to be enough. So we, we really want to think about that more in a daily perspective. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, another question. Should we use good vocal projection techniques? I think this is a trick question, but I'll read it out <laughs> anyway. Should we use good vocal projection techniques when we are speaking in public, i.e. at a gathering, presenting to a group of people? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> or use amplification if it's that big a room. <laughs> use a microphone. <laughs> yeah. All right. At what point does powerful, strong singing become shouting? It seems, um, seems to me, when listening to programs like The Voice, that the judges seem to fawn over those performers who can shout the loudest. Am I alone in this assessment? Well, again, that's a bit of a tricky one in that, uh, it may seem like it's shouted, but it could actually be really great vocal production belt or whatnot. So it, it could, you know, it may, it may appear like it's shouting, but it, unless there's strain involved in it, it possibly isn't. So it's, I guess it's a bit of a fine line question, really. Yeah, perfect. All right, guys, I've only got a few more questions to go. So if you um, have anything you want to ask, send it through now. Oh, I've got a question actually here from Richard Reed from Australia. I usually dismiss you straight, just dismiss you straight away, but I think, we'll, I think we'll give him a go tonight. Um, replace a great deal of time and effort training to sing well. What's the difference between singing and speaking? Why don't we have to train as much to speak? Well, it's interesting that, particularly in recent years where there's a lot of talk towards in, in our barbershop community about trying to sing in a more spoken manner. But the difference, I guess, is more about the amount of energy that is exerted when we sing versus when we speak. So the amount of air that has to pass through, um, the, the speed at which the vocal folds are having to move, uh, you know, that's all going to influence that, um, how much more work's required for singing versus speaking. Yeah, perfect. And um, the final question we have for the moment, we just never know what might happen on BHA Live, but <laughs> is a consistently low larynx ideal? I get that would depend very much on the art form that you're singing. It has its time and a place in various art forms, uh, depending on the point that's being made. All right. Oh, we've had another one in from Daniel Bennett. I've often heard people say that Africans sing better than other folks around the globe. Is this a genetic advantage or? Um, pass. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, but yeah it's, it's actually a good question though because i mean it's a great question <laughs> if we look at some of our, our new zealand friends or you know some of our friends in in bhs um people from different cultural backgrounds have different singing ability mm. so it I, is I wonder how much of it is associated with a, a cultural um, so in in those in those cultures that we just, we've just discussed, they have a tendency to want to sing anyhow. So from very young age, everybody sings and sings, and there's no judgment associated with that. So you have to wonder how much of that is just partially because of freedom of freedom to express oneself without fear of judgment. 
Yeah, absolutely. All right, sure. any, um, we've still got a few minutes left, guys. So um, if you have any more questions, um, please, oh, Ian, thank you, mate. <laughs> the same could be said for our Russian bases. Maybe they can sing so low because they train to do so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was talking to a friend of mine a number of years ago and that, they were, she was saying that, you know, that her voice is a, was a, it was a gift. It was a God given gift was her, was her words, but that it was her responsibility to take that gift and train it to be the best that it could be. And so it's, yeah. you know, that, that works really important in the development. Yeah. Oh, we've got another question. <clears throat> now, I think I know the answer to this one, but, but I won't spoil it for you, Beck, because I, I do sing with a, uh, um, a father and his two sons, sons, but do siblings, people from the same family, blend better? Uh, I think the answer, look, in, in my experience, I, I've, I agree, with, agree with Trev that, you know, there, there, is, a, there is something to be um, said for singing with family members because of the, you know, the genetic structures or, you know, similar, we have similarities and things like that. My experience is the same. Um, in fact, uh, my, uh, just before my nan died a couple of years ago, we were really fortunate for my mum and my nan and I to all be home for Christmas and singing together around the piano. And there's a recording floating around somewhere of us singing and it, you can't tell the voices apart. And yet there was nearly 60 years between the voices across them. So, you know, there is something to be said about the genetic, genetic structure of the voice and the similarities as a result. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. And that's, that's my experience singing with this particular quartet. No, I'm very blessed to sing with the three of them. <clears throat> Wonderful experience. <laughs> oh, a hundred percent is hundred percent is. Um, I guess a, a, a comment and a question. Uh, bases in American singing seem to be deeper voiced and more resonant. Is this a physical thing? I think we'll find it's probably just a work thing again. If, you know, extended their range down. You know, they're, they're, you know, they've got the capacity to go down there because they've worked to get down there. That doesn't mean that we can't get there as well. But some of it's probably genetics too. Yeah. And um, I've got a comment from our uh, speech pathologist, Helen. There are some physical differences between different cultures and some of the differences will enhance the resonance because the vocal tracks are more similar. This applies to siblings and family members. So there right. you go. Thank you. Um, another question or, or statement here. When Scott, Scott Kitts Miller, an instant classic, came to Adelaide, Scott said that Cole and Kyle, the brothers, were the least similar in resonance among the four singers. Interesting. So not, it's not the uh, family traits doesn't cut through across all families then. <laughs> Yeah, true. <laughs> no, we have, we've, we've spoken a little bit about it, extending ranges back. What is a good way to, to actually, if you're a bass, sing lower, or if you're a tenor, um, sing higher or sing lower maybe in your, your falsetto or sing higher in your, your mixed voice? What's, what's some good techniques we can take away and practice? So again, it's back to that efficient, effective, purposeful practice. So making sure that every day there's some work in your range work on range extension and range stretch. Mm -hmm. So some scales, some sirens, um, trying to move the voice. And in fact, both ways, you know, stretch it one way, may as well stretch it the other way as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, using scales and going right up to the top of our range and right down to the bottom of our range, making sure that we've already done some warm up first and then stretching out. And eventually with time, you know, the more that we work that, the, the further we can get. Yeah, and how often should we, we actually be practicing these techniques is it a daily thing twice a day you know once a month it's a daily thing mm -hmm. in terms of how often a day there's some really great uh, research out there that's talking about practice efficient practice and practice is more efficient when it's shorter periods scattered across the day rather than ch big massive chunks of time that we're trying to achieve that work in you know you think about when you try and cram for an exam you know if it's if you just do a big chunk of it it's forgotten very quickly and so we need to give our muscle memory a chance to take on that new knowledge and, you know, um, make it become subconscious. Yep, and that, that's why you do it just before an exam. Uh, but obviously yeah. that, doesn't, that doesn't apply to singing. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it does in that if we just do it just before chorus rehearsal and that's it, we know how efficient that's going to be. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and I didn't plan this, but you know, a follow-up question. Is there a physical limit to our vocal range? Why are some people tenors and other basses? And further to that, is there a limit on how far we can extend our range? The short answer is yes, really, in that, you know, there's, we're, we're again, it's back to genetics. So, you know, we're, we're just the way that we all look differently and we speak differently, we look different, we are different builds and different shapes, then so is our vocal tract and, and the vocal apparatus because it's all, you know, affected by the shape of our body and the genetics that we, you know, we're born with. So there is, that's going to influence what our vo voice can do in terms of how high or how low whether we're a high voice or a low voice firstly and secondly how high and low we can stretch our voice that doesn't mean we can't actually extend our voice but there's going to be a point where it won't go any further yeah perfect and again i guess that goes towards you know some people are naturally going to be tenors some people are naturally going to be basses and I'm some of us will want to be basses <laughs> i think everybody who's not a bass is probably <laughs> <laughs> um this is interesting, actually. I've noticed this as well. Why is it that basses can often sing tenor more so than other parts can? Hmm. Actually, I'm going to throw that one out to Helen because I know she's sitting there um, and she can probably answer that one with a little bit more efficiency than I can. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we're waiting for Helen to respond. Um, we've got another qu uh, comment slash question is, um, when singing in a group, is it easier to relax the vocal co uh, vocal cords? Why would you want to be relaxing your vocal cords when you're in a group or at all? I I, I think I think that uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, uh, the person who's asked that question, I'm not sure who it is. Uh, are you asking how can I? Is it easier to relax your voice uh, in a group versus a quartet? Possibly. Let's go. With that. Uh, Let's go with that. So I, isn't it interesting how the psyche is influences what we do when we sing and when we perform. And so in the same way that a nerves and tension seizes up the rest of the body, it can seize up the voice as well. So yeah, there is an element of when we sing in a group, there's like safety in numbers. So we relax. And so as a result, we, you know, we relax our vocal mechanism and use it more in a more efficient manner rather than it being restricted because of nerves. Yep. Okay. And we had clarification. Yes, your voice. And I guess a part yes, of it is, yeah, in, in, <laughs> my experience in, in choral singing in a group opposed to a quartet, you have um, what we affectionately call chorus breathing, which gives us more opportunities to reset mm. the larynx and Absolutely. Be a little bit more relaxed. That'll help as well. Uh, well, we haven't heard from um, Helen, but we have um, Dr. Ian, and um, <laughs> he says the bass's falsetto range falls more easily into the tenor range uh, for barbershop, whereas a chest voice tenor's falsetto would actually be higher, kind of like Tim Warwick. And we actually do now have a response for Helen, so um, Ian, I hope you're right there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Helen says, both singing tenor and bass requires a singer to have learned to stretch the vocal folds to their extremes, thinning them out to sing high and allowing them to thicken to sing in low pitches. It is often recommended that the bass works more on extending the higher range and vice versa. So there we go. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we don't have any more questions. So we might actually wrap it up there so thanks beck for sharing um all of your wonderful knowledge with that i must say um without a doubt that is the most engagement that we've had from any any of our sessions so thank you so much that was absolutely fantastic my pleasure thank you for having me and thank you for all the fantastic questions and thank you to uh helen and ian for your fabulous input as well and and everybody else who contributed to the questions and comments today as well <laughs> So again, thank you, Beck. And remember folks, this session will be available shortly on the BHA YouTube channel. Go to the YouTube and search Barbershop Harmony Australia for this and all of our previous sessions. And next week, we have a great, great session with your BHA council. So we're gonna have another town hall. And this one's gonna be titled, Everything You Wanted to Know About BHA, But Didn't Know Who to Ask. So make sure you tune in. It'll be the same time, same place. That's BHA Live every Friday night at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. Spread the news. I've been your host, Trevor Gruger. Have a great night.